design and model an original character and use Blender to bring it to life. Those were my goals when I started this project nearly two years ago. Now countless revisions later, hundreds of hours of modeling and texturing, and thousands of dollars of rendering time, I finally finished. What started out as just a simple idea turned into a project of epic proportions. This is how I made a Dragon Hunter with Blender. So why even make a Dragon Hunter? What's the idea there? Uh, well, for fun, and I wanted to do something fresh and different, and I had just come off of making Flex, and she was a stylized sci-fi girl, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. You know, I love these strong genres and I love things like Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones. So I very much wanted to create a character in the style, in the theme of this epic dark fantasy world. And my main goals were to work on and practice more creating original designs and also learning Blender. This is merging the two. And as with all my projects, obviously if it goes well, I'd want to add it to my portfolio and post it to artstation.com who are incidentally sponsoring this video. So shout out to Artstation and more about them later on. In coming up with a kind of a dark fantasy world, I came up with a few character ideas that I liked, but this one seemed the most straightforward, ironically. So let's jump into the reference and I'll show you what I was thinking. So here we are in my original reference board. You can see if I go bird's eye view, some different things here. Now the ingredients were this main protagonist, let's say, and obviously the dragon and final presentation. Originally, I thought I was just gonna be doing a model, like a high poly model, but uh, I couldn't help myself. So jumping back over here. Now the idea was to do this sort of protagonist character that's not this pure good. And really the kinds of characters I'm thinking about is like the Aragorn, Will Turner from Pirates of the Caribbean, obviously Jon Snow, which you can see in here. Heroic character that's not super buff. Ign ignore this for a second. Patchy beard, you know? And I wanted to obviously tie it in with the dragon and I wanted to kind of exercise and show off modeling skills and just get into the, into the modeling. And this was the key reference that I went off of. I didn't make this. This is a photo bash of this Dracula movie plus Jon Snow. And I just thought this hit the vibe for sure. It gives me lots of opportunity to show different kinds of modeling. It incorporates the dragon theme and motif. You know, it's super detailed, wavy hair, dark haired, roguish character. So once I defined the vision and I put together this reference board, I jumped into ZBrush and I started with my base mesh and just started adding things to the costume because I'm going to finish the design in 3D. So starting out this project in ZBrush with my base mesh, as I do all my character projects. When I did start this project all this time ago, I wasn't even sure if I'd be using Blender at all. But ultimately in this workflow, what I'm doing is I'm replacing Maya with Blender. So either way, I would probably be starting any kind of high poly character model in ZBrush. It is a tool that's made just for this purpose and it's where I feel most comfortable. In the early stages, it's all about being fast and loose. I'm just ripping off pieces of the model to create costume elements, using things like this curve brush to make a belt. I know he's gonna have at least one belt, and I also know that layers is gonna be one of the main tools I have in the design. So we're starting to block out different elements of a costume that can layer together to create something that looks a little bit more complex. And even the armor themselves, I started to overlap them in kind of a scallop pattern to hopefully evoke the feeling of scales like the dragon. You can see I'm trying to add sharp points and swoops to some of the different elements of the costume. Again, to try to make things look like a dragon's wing, like dragon's claws, that's the idea. I even experimented with a couple different ideas on how to incorporate a dragon. Like one is literal as just trying to sculpt a dragon kind of shape to put it on his shoulder pad. Very much like that original concept, but I just didn't get to a point where I felt like anything was gonna work. I even tried adding the dragon to his chest, which kind of works more as like a Batman logo and uh, quickly deleted that. I sketched out a few designs and was really just going in circles with trying to find a way to force a connection with the dragon here somehow in the model. I gave up on a lot of those ideas and went with something more simple with just the curves and sharp, dangerous looking edges, essentially trying to boil it down to something I thought could be a motif that worked, but it really did start to lose the dragon hunter vibe. An idea I did like though was incorporating that dragon motif into his leather belt, the main one that would be holding his sword ultimately. And I thought adding sort of a dragon pattern as leather embossed work could be a cool way to add detail and story. So I used Photoshop to create this tiling texture of scales and a pattern that would tile horizontally. I could use this as a height map 
which means white would be pushing up and black would be pushing down. Using the noise maker inside of ZBrush, I could apply this texture map now and actually push the vertices so I could get the embossed leather belt look in 3D. I did feel like the belt was overall kind of successful, but at this point, I didn't really know where to go with the character. So I sent the model over to Keyshot to do some renders so I could actually see with some materials and real lighting how it was feeling to see if I get a different opinion and what I could do to improve it. I still wasn't feeling it at this point and it had been about 30 hours of work. So after hitting my head against a brick wall for a while and taking a break and coming back to it, it became immediately clear what the issue was. So if we jump back over to the reference board they were looking at, you can see here, we are getting close to this, maybe not as detailed, but the problem for me was, is the character that I was creating didn't feel unique, like an individual. But another issue kind of arose, and it's obvious now because I'm drawing from references like this and like this, right? Is this like idea of regality and wealth. It, it didn't jive with my initial idea. Like I want a kind of an underdog. I don't want like a rich guy who's in like perfect armor. And you can see here, these armors are like head to toe complete. And that's also what added to this feeling of a uniform. And so I realized to do this kind of roguish vibe, it needs to be all over the place. So I went on another reference hunt and you can see things got bigger and bigger and bigger. The thing that I liked about this dragon motif is not only that it's a lot of detail, but it does the storytelling for me. This is a dragon hunter. And so in this new kind of roguish direction, what I realized was what I got to do to tell the story is have a mix of clothing. What I want is to make a character that feels like they've been on this epic journey or adventure and they've kind of started with something and maybe they've picked up treasures and things along the way. Maybe something happened to a costume and he has to like mend it with something, you know, like he has to tie different strings. What that ends up meaning is, is that we need buttons and belts, buckles, chains, things that are different from each other in their design language. If I have mixtures of design languages on the character, but then within the items of the costume, that mixed with different materials and some slightly different colors, I could try to create the effect of this worldly costume that hopefully feels like this unique individual, this one of a kind dragon hunter guy. So this new kind of roguish direction gave this project new life. And I went back into ZBrush and started just totally removing a bunch of the stuff that wasn't working. Really just stripping the character right back down to its bare essentials, kind of the building blocks. Tried to recycle as many pieces as I could and emphasize those things we were talking about, the asymmetry breaking things that would make it feel like a uniform. And then obviously adding a hood, because if you add a hood, your character will look like a rogue, okay? Everybody knows that. Now, just after one little session, you can already tell the difference between the two characters and how one feels a lot more like a rogue. So I took a screenshot of that and opened it in Photoshop and then did some painting on top and tried different things to experiment and get more of a clear direction of where I wanted to go in 3D. So I ended up with something that I liked and then jumped back in 3D and used that as my reference. With this new direction and design of trying to make this roguish character, a character that's more or less wearing their story of the journey they've been on, I can't rely on things like symmetry and reusing assets like I would with other types of characters. Solving one problem over here doesn't necessarily mean I'm solving a problem over here. The character in the end is going to be more almost like a collage. So I really leaned into that and I just had fun isolating different parts and working on them for a while. Since the leather dragon belt was probably my favorite element from the original and one of the things that lasted, I really wanted to double down on that and I thought doing a big ass dragony belt buckle could help make this one of those standout elements like they found it on an adventure and they're almost like treasures or things that are important to the character. So I had to figure out how to do a spicy dragon belt. So I did some sketching in Photoshop using symmetry and stuff and played around this kind of dragon eating a dragon infinite loop kind of idea. I turned that into a mask that I brought into Z brush which I generated some geometry from as a base to start sculpting and I really worked it out in 3d kind of pushing and pulling eventually adding a scale pattern to that to get an even more micro detail and then finally beating it up a little bit in the end I think it's going to be kind of a pewter kind of metal material so just making sure that it has enough details to kind of catch and glint and feel like it's something that's high quality and very ornate I also made a variety of belts and buckles and buttons some of those also being a little bit more ornate than others adding them to the bits of the costume that I thought matched. So we'd have more of like a butch leather armor kind of thing. And then the more dragon leather tunic that he's wearing underneath, a little bit more ornate and valuable feeling. There were so many things to add that I even created my own little custom brushes to help with adding straps, stitches, and the little weave details so that I could reuse it over and over and a little bit more quickly. 
it was fun, honestly, just going down the rabbit hole and letting myself spend too much time and going way, way, way too close and actually adding details like this in the 3D model. And I had fun really coming up with and creating these dragon filled details like this dragon tooth knife. He's got dragon blood plus 15 health points. Dragon's breath, you know, from the glands of a dragon. And of course, dragon scale armor made from the skin of a dragon. In fact, this whole arm is armored. The thinking being dragon skin and dragon scales would be fireproof. So I wanted his arm to feel fireproof and elements of his costume have kind of a fireproof inspiration. Now, before I export this whole thing and bring it into Blender, we have to do a few things. First, we gotta put a fresh coat of paint on here. One of the things I wanted to try in the workflow was skipping out on texturing and UV mapping that you would do in a production workflow and just painting colors in ZBrush and then mixing that with things in Blender. So I used Poly Paint and ZBrush to lay down some colors, kind of just airbrushing basic colors, but also just bringing in textures that have some detail and painting through that to get some cheeky detail in some models too. After he's painted up, we need to decimate this because right now this whole character is like over a hundred million polygons. It's a lot. I can't just export it. That would take forever, A. And B, it would be so slow working with it. I don't even know if my graphics card would be able to render it. So we need to crunch this down to a manageable number. To do that, you need Decimation Master and ZBrush. Really just lets you pick a percentage. You try a couple different things. Make sure you, you're keeping the model detail that you have, but then you make it as low as possible. So I ran through all the subtools and I did that to each one, preserving the color that we painted. And now after all this time, we have a high poly character that we can export and finally use Blender. But before we export it, I do want to get my feet wet in Blender. You know, you got to walk before you run. So I thought it would be wise to start small. So I chose a couple elements of the costume that would be good test cases to take all the way through as kind of micro projects. I chose the fire potion and the sword, thinking the fire potion would be pretty easy and the sword would give me some opportunity to do a little bit more complex things that I need to do for the workflow. These little projects gave me the opportunity to do basics like just exporting and importing the models, creating procedural materials that I'm going to use a lot on the final character, and then doing basic things like setting up lights and an environment and creating final renders. The more I worked on these scenes and in Blender, the more fun I had. I ended up with the fire potion scene going a little bit farther and bringing in extra textures to kind of make a table that it was sitting on. And I even scattered dust on top of it to create kind of a macro photography look. So once I was done with these little micro projects, I felt a lot more confident in using Blender and we got some extra renders for the final presentation. And I get to use this work in the final scene because I can just copy and paste these things and we'll already have a head start on our look dev. And now all that's left to do to work on our full character is to finally click export. We're finally in Blender. Behold, Blenderness. Look, look, we're in Blender. Feels good to finally make this transition. Should be fun to do the look dev and materials and stuff in here. That's what we're gonna do. Now that we're finally in Blender, it's time to make things pretty. So I first loaded in an HGRI environment to light things up and then started creating materials to apply to the costume. Applying the different materials with the different properties and then tweaking the colors and seeing how they balance together. It's just fun to kind of like decorate the character you've been working on for so long and finally see it come together. Not only am I adding the different materials and colors, but I'm adding like little bits of detail and tiling detail for the things like the leather and the fabric, which help the materials feel real. And then rendering it in cycles to check everything, we're finally seeing the character in this realistic light for the first time, which gives you this whole new perspective. In doing all the texture or material work during this look dev, I'm using tileable textures and procedurals that I've collected over time, most of which coming from the Substance Source Library. One of the more important aspects I knew was gonna be this outer layer, this kind of tunic. So I went onto the library and I started searching for different kinds of animal leather and patterns. Then I imported those materials into Sampler so that I could export tiling texture sets. So I tried two different things. One meant to be sort of a dragon leather, hopefully looking a little bit like dragon skin, in this case, crocodile. And then the other one is more of a geometric pattern. So I tried both to see what I liked more. And I definitely liked this dragon leather. I thought it looked a lot more interesting. I think this phase of the process might be my favorite, seeing it come to life and starting to blend things together, to layer things like dirt and wear, maybe make the edges a little bit brighter, try to make things look like scuffs, 
give roughness variation, and really start to build things out to make it look a little bit more believable, a little bit more lived in, and play with things like scale so that when we look close up at the individual elements, we can see little bits of wear and tear to add to the feeling of depth and storytelling like this character's from a world, and to bring scale and an overall level of detail. At this point, the body's coming along pretty well, so now it's time we need to shift focus over to the head and the face area to make some progress there. So obviously with every character, the face is really important. And now it's time that I really start to focus on the neck up. Once I got it into Blender with the real lighting and started doing test renders, the proportions felt off and I just lost the vibe that I felt I had in ZBrush. And sometimes it's hard to tell because when you're in ZBrush, things feel totally different and just making millimeter changes can make a really big impact. So I focused on the head for a period of time to really try to get that vibe I initially wanted. So I went back to ZBrush and I started to refine the sculpt, play with proportion a little bit. And I also knew that I wanted to do displacement so I could do close-ups in Blender and really try to make a really high quality looking render. So I added the tiny details in ZBrush using my skin detailing kit. I made a more detailed video for channel members, but I essentially just subdivided it up high and I just added the different pores and wrinkles by hand that way. Just spent time making sure the scale between all the details was correct and tried to capture an age that I felt was young enough to be this archetype I was after, had enough detail to hold up in close-ups, and also felt like hopefully a guy that's been out and about. I also wanted to add this scar. I knew from the beginning I thought it'd be fun to show a scar that goes from the face and through the different hair pieces so that I could remove those hairs, try to tie the whole thing together, and also again tell kind of a story. It's not really important if the viewer gets this, but what I was thinking with the scar was like a scratch maybe from a close encounter, you know, of a little baby dragon or something, and I put it on the far side of his costume, so this is more of his quote unquote unprotected side, and I knew I wanted this scar to come up into the hairline. So after adding all the skin details and the scar, I can export all this detail out as a displacement map. And then when we render in Blender, I can have the mesh subdivide and we can get a very high poly head in the renders with all this sculpted detail. For the face texture itself, I use Substance Painter to actually paint by hand, which is different than what I did for the rest of the character, which is more this procedural method, which isn't really using UVs and it really isn't using hand painted work. But for the face, it was important for me to be able to go in there and paint where things go, be a lot more specific. So Substance Painter is great for making textures where you need ultimate control. The hair. Might sound funny, but hair is the reason why I had yet to make a character with Blender. And I just wasn't confident that I'd be able to make something that I would be happy with. But that changed with the release of Blender 3.5 and the new hair tools. So now there really wasn't any excuse. And I thought, this is the time. So I made the leap. Luckily, Blender does a good job with documentation. And along with the release, they dropped a few tutorials that I tried to follow along with. And they also released a public demo file that had examples of hairstyles in there that you could look at and, and really take apart, which I did. And I was lucky enough to be able to get on a call with Daniel Bystead, who is the artist that played a vital role in the creation of the hair system. So he was the perfect person to talk to, and he really helped me. He was really generous with his time. So after the call with Daniel, I did try my hand at making a groom relatively quickly in a test scene, just get my feet wet and try to mix things together to see what I could get. I thought that test was pretty successful and gave me enough confidence to jump into the actual scene and make some stuff. I started small by doing things like the eyebrows and the eyelashes, working my way up to the beard and painting in that patchy growth pattern to maintain the archetype we were after from the beginning and keeping this guy boyishly handsome. For the full hairstyle, I went through several ideas that I liked, but ultimately ended on the Jack Dawson look. I mean, look at this guy. But then I really like this idea of the scar from maybe a previous uh, adventure. So to do that, I needed some short enough hair to see a cut in the side, and I wanted the length to have it fall in front of the eye. So I ended up making this mishmash of a hairstyle, and I tried to leave it choppy and messy as if he kind of did it himself. I didn't want it to look like he got a fresh cut from a barber, obviously, you know, because he's like from a fantasy world. Ultimately, I'm pretty happy with how it came out, especially for my first real shot at using Blender's hair tools, which I think are pretty good and definitely a huge improvement from what they had before. So looking forward to trying to make more things with that. So that's it for the main hairstyle. You can see here the evolution of the process. Took me a while to get there, but we finally did it. Here's a look at the final node network for that groom. And I didn't just stop right there. I also thought, hey, we came this far. Maybe we'll go a little bit further and I'll add a little bit of peach fuzz. You know, I got to the point where I was like, why not? It's gonna take me a little bit of time. So I added it pretty quickly to add a little something to the close-ups. Once the hair was really dialed in, 
Then it's finally time to make some cinematic renders. I wanted to start building the presentation for this guy. First and foremost, that means posing. You know, with all my characters, I try to at least make them feel like they're coming to life. And in this case, I thought like a frame from a moment while he's maybe walking through a dungeon, looking around corners and stuff. You know, we got the dragon. I thought, why not bring in the dungeon? For reference, again, I used myself doing my best sort of dragon hunter impression, you know, really embodying the character. <clears throat> I posed him in ZBrush using Transpose Master and just moving everything around by hand. I use a little trick of making long little objects poking out the eye so that I can also have them converge on a point for the camera. After having the posed version, then I exported everything and brought it back into Blender and assigned those materials. For getting the hair on the posed version, similar to Maya where you would use a blend shape, in Blender you would use a shape key. So by using my new pose mesh as the shape key, I can snap my original model into position and bring over the hair, the beard, and the fuzz. But this scene is still missing an important ingredient. Fire. Obviously fire. I mean, come on. Okay, but first I have to like, you know, figure out how to do fire. So what I did was a quick test just to even see if I could make a flaming sword in Blender. And I used a few tutorials and documentation online. Shout out to Polyfjord for his awesome tutorials. The results of my test seemed good enough that I thought maybe I could pull it off. So I jumped back into the real scene and began forging the hottest of swords. Ultimately, it came down to the voxel size and I just wasn't feeling this chunky boxy fire. You know, I'm not trying to make Minecraft fire over here. Before abandoning the idea, I did some research and I hit up some of my VFX wizard friends and they recommended software called Embergen. I had actually heard of this magical software before, but I figured it was over my head. But now I was desperate, you know, we've come this far. So I went to the website and I got the free trial and guess what? I made a flaming sword. It was honestly pretty easy to use and it produced awesome results. Just shout out to Embergen for being dope. It can even export VDBs and you can include temperature, which allowed me to plug in Blender's own volume material to finalize the look in the scene. Still, I don't think this is feeling epic enough. I want to build out this dungeon environment and I think it's fun to include as many things as possible in the actual 3D scene. So I imported a couple cloud assets that I already had in my library and I laid them down on the floor here to help create like a smoky atmosphere and make things feel more epic. Next, I brought in a couple assets from the Quixel Megascans library. So again, it's free for me to just like do a little search and I brought in like an archway and then some ground covering. I assigned the textures into a material, really simple. The archway is pretty much just exactly as is. I just brought it in and it's in the background so I didn't even use displacement. It's just there to be in the depth of field and have light interaction. And then I tweaked the material of the ground to make it more dark, kind of a dungeon ground, but just have a ground there in general to interact, to make the scene a lot more cinematic and flushed out. So now the pieces are finally in place, I can start to focus on creating final renders and images to build a presentation for this project. And that presentation will eventually be published at artstation.com, who is also the sponsor of this video. So thank you to them for that. Artstation is a website that lets you easily host your portfolio online and get the eyeballs on it from people in the actual industry. It's free to sign up and use. I feel like I don't need to tell you that if you watch my videos, but I do want to tell you about the ArtStation Pro membership. I've had a pro membership for as many years as they've had it. And what I love about it is just being able to share higher quality images and videos and be able to host my own branded website. So my website, artofjhill.com, is an ArtStation website. ArtStation is where I publish my projects, so I don't want to have to manage a separate website and upload it. And the fact that with ArtStation, I can have my portfolio, my online store, my blog, all in one place, all in one platform, and I don't have to cross post and all that stuff. It just makes my life easier. And their Learn platform, which is still free at this time, is an insane value. I think ArtStation.com is a no-brainer to sign up. It's free. If you get more serious about posting your work, trying to get hired, that sort of thing, or you just want to take advantage of all those extra features, then sign up for a pro membership. And when you do use code JHill30 to save 30% off, that's essentially two months off of a year membership. On this project, I rendered several different high resolution images and video, and I tried to organize my presentation so that the more someone scrolls, the more kind of nerdy details they get. 
I want to show off the character in the model in several different lighting environments and angles, including close-ups to give people time to appreciate if they want to. So definitely first finish this video and then head over to artstation.com slash jhill to check out this final presentation. And if you want to become a pro member, remember to use code jhill30 to save 30%. So we've got our presentation put together at ArtStation, which you can check out, but this is a YouTube video, you know? We've come this far, so why not go a little farther? I, I wanted to move the camera around and make some videos here. And so I ended up creating another scene and I added a few different cameras. And by creating markers on the timeline and linking those to the different cameras, I can create a sequence that will cut between them. I knew I didn't have enough time to render this whole thing, even though I do have two computers. One little section that was about three seconds long took my machine with a 4090 card like two days to render. So I tried using a render farm for the first time. And now a couple thousand dollars later and a few hundred rendering hours later, I finally have a video sequence that I can share with you guys. And here's that video now. And that is how I made this Dragon Hunter with Blender and ZBrush and Substance. So obviously learned a ton on this one. And uh, I think the main takeaway though that I wanna share with you is just that take your time with your personal projects. Sometimes people put limitations on themselves. And I think when you're doing your personal projects, the sky's the limit. You know, obviously we want to be fast. We want to be efficient but speed comes with confidence, which comes from experience, which comes from practice. We have to be practicing to build all these things. And that's what we're doing right now, we're practicing. So personal work is the perfect time to try new things, you know, to fail, to take on too much. And I think, you know, if it takes a long time, it takes a long time. To me, what's important is doing it going through it, achieving the goals you set out to do. And if it takes a long time, it takes a long time. So just don't give up on your projects. Be relentless. On to the next one. Peace out. See you next time.